I'm going to give you guys updates along with my opinion and analysis of some unicorn bubble stocks like Beyond Meat, Tilray, and Tesla Motors. But first, I have to do this stupid disclaimer. So everything I say here on this recording, on the show, live show, and eventually after it's recorded is for informational and educational purposes only, and it is my opinion. It does not constitute investment advice. I no longer have my series series seven and series 66 thank god and if you are con doing this solely as investing advice without doing any more research or and due diligence you probably already lost a lot of money shorting some of these stocks <laughs> because the timing on these things is really really tough considering the bubble dynamics that we're in with central banks and these high frequency trading algorithms and the stuff that these company the management at these companies can get away with basically just issuing press releases that don't normally guarantee any revenue increase or, or let alone any uh, well don't guarantee any earnings but at least some of them guarantee revenue increases and I'll talk about that in a minute so first let me talk about Beyond Meat so for those of you who are not aware I did a initial short lecture or video on Beyond Meat and my opinion on that on June 10th, I looked up the date. So I said, massive short squeeze in Beyond Meat. The venture capitalist dumped another bad company onto public markets. So if you're not familiar with that stock, the stock has just been on fire. Now, when I did that show, I believe the stock crashed and it dropped 40% in about 24 hours. But in about a week's time period, if I'm looking at the chart correctly, it rebounded very, very powerfully. So it gained... All, all of its losses back and has just continued on from there. So I want to read some staggering increases on Beyond Meat. I have two really good articles from two well-respected people. Bert Doman, who's a professional money manager and trader, he wrote an article about Beyond Meat on July 18th that was submitted to Zero Hedge. He runs Doman Capital. He uses fundamentals and technicals, um, and he has good analysis on Beyond Meat if you want to look at that article. Uh, also, the guy on Twitter who is Ramp Capital, that guy's really funny. He's a longtime pro financial professional. He doesn't use his real name. And he has a blog website, and he's been writing about Beyond Meat. His article here, and I'll just talk about some of the, if you're not familiar with the share prices of Beyond Meat. So Beyond Meat went public on May 2nd, where it opened at $46 per share. And it hit over $200 per share. Now, it's since corrected because they just issued recently a press release that they're going to raise more capital. So this was predictable. And what is also predictable is once that lockup period, and I talked about this on the first show that I talked about Beyond Meat, is if you want to do your due diligence and your research and you're looking for options plays, for puts and calls to trade volatility on a stock that can drop 40% in a day or go up hundreds of percent in a short amount of time. So there's options, opportunities there with puts and calls with leverage with the options. If you know fundamental and technical analysis, then you use the options for leverage. But they just issued a press release that they're going to raise, let me pull up the Seeking Alpha article here, 3,250,000 more shares on a secondary offering. So the management team said, wow, we the share prices are up over tenfold since the IPO price. The IPO offering was $25 a share. It will almost tenfold. The share prices were almost up tenfold per share. And they were like, well, we should just raise some more money. And eventually once that lockup period happens, and in order to find the lockup period for Beyond Meat, you have to go through the financial documents. So you have to go through the annual report. Normally, it might say it in like the executive compensation section where it lists the stock option that the senior management and the CEOs get. It may say it in there. Sometimes they bury it because they don't want people, a lot of people knowing exactly when the lockup period expires. But there are a lot of insiders in Beyond Meat who have tenfold gains or more because some of these guys were in before the IPO price. They owned a lot of shares, millions of shares before the, the stock IPO'd at $25 per share. So the share price went quickly from 25, it opened at 46. So that's again, the Wall Street insiders, no retail person, only SEC accredited investors or high net worth people actually got the shares at 25. And 
It's a 200% gain from the first trading day closing price, approximately a 350% gain if you bought it on the open. It's up over 700% from the offering price of $25 per share. It has become one of the most talked about and controversial stocks in the market. So there's a lot of good analysis in this article talking about competition like Tyson Foods, Hormel, Mondelez. Um, you have companies like Nestle and Tyson Foods that are announcing com competing products. But right now, a company like Beyond Meat is they are in growth story mode. So as long as the management team can issue press releases that sound like revenues are going to grow, revenues don't really have to even grow too much in the short term until quarterly reports for the stock price to keep going higher. All management has to do, and this is why I don't like these stock uh, these stock quote, air quotes markets nowadays is because the algorithms can be fooled by just issuing press releases that don't really mean anything significant. So the market cap for Beyond Meat right now is it was as high as $13 trillion, which is nuts because I don't think they've ever been profitable in their company history. The market. OK, so the market cap is at 13.36, excuse me, $13.36 billion. Uh, you want a comp? Here's a comp for another food company. Their market cap is almost to the levels, not that far off. Chipotle has a $22.32 billion market cap, and Chipotle Mexican Grill makes almost $9 earnings per share. <laughs> and people say Chipotle is too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so so you cannot short a stock this is not financial advice again stupid disclaimer you cannot short a stock just on valuation but two maybe three years i would say at most three years from now the beyond meat story unless the management team executes and can actually get earnings to go with that revenue growth and stops diluting the stock this is going to end in tears for anyone who is long that stock it is guaranteed because they have a market cap now that is larger than many other producing food companies that make a profit. And the food industry in general is capital intensive, low margin, not necessarily good businesses. Okay, they don't normally, a lot of these food companies don't have moats. Chipotle doesn't have an enormous moat. A lot of these food processing companies don't have enormous moats. And Beyond Meat doesn't have any real intellectual property. There's, it's highlighted in this article by Bert Doman talking about that. So they're competing, Beyond Meat is competing against Bill Gates and his Impossible Burger. So they're competing against a billionaire who likes his product. And the Impossible Burger won awards at, I think, the Com Consumer Electronics Show. So it won awards there in CES 2019. They were giving away free samples to all these tech people, and a lot, there was a lot of positive reviews there. It won an award for the show. And the Impossible Burger is also going into high-end casual dining bur uh, burger restaurants like The Counter, which is a chain on the East Coast. So there, there is a lot of competition. Add in the fact that Nestle Foods and Tyson Foods have competing products too, that there is no moat here. Well, Bill, Bill Burger Billionaire Gates. <laughs> so the timing on these things is tricky. I saw a post from someone below the Beyond Meat video who came back and posted this like a couple of weeks ago because I did the video over a month ago. And he was saying, well, I realize the fundamental story is going to break, but he, that's the timing. If you go back and listen to that video, and I'll put it at the end of this video when it's over, I specifically said you can't short it. You can't short it yet. There was no evidence that this was a busted growth stock, that the growth, the, the, that the revenue growth story had stopped. And that's the problem because you're competing against the management team where they have all these marketing and PR firms and they don't even have to make any earnings. They only have to increase revenue. And in a lot of cases now, guys, a lot of momentum traders and high frequency trading algorithms and these and these um, turtle traders, these these momentum guys, they do not care if the stock is profitable as long as the chart looks good and they're growing revenues. That's very similar to the Investor's Business Daily model, although the Investor's Business Daily in growth investors model normally likes earnings growth. But if revenue is growing, I think like the they get a higher momentum score. So David Einhorn actually has put out in his uh, latest investors newsletter, there's articles that came out in the last week or so talking about this, and he was bashing Chewy, which is, he compares to Pets.com. 
So get this, quote, for those who think that the 2000 bubble was the big kahuna considered chewy, which went public in June of 2019, David Einhorn said, shares of the online pet retailer were up more than 2% and have soared more than 50% since its public debut in June. Einhorn pointed to Chewy's current debt and market value, which he said is 30 times the value of Pets.com at its peak, as reasons for skepticism. So, quote, over its life, Pets.com chewed through just over $200 million of investor capital, end quote, Einhorn said. Chewy has burned $1.6 billion and counting. <laughs> if you want to read more of the David Einhorn article, Einhorn, Einhorn is... A genius. I think he is one of the smartest people in the financial world. Now, the thing with these short guys is timing and fraud. So you're even when a genius accounting expert, accounting wizard like David Einhorn spots fraud, it doesn't guarantee the stock's going to crash. In fact, in today's environment, in these stock markets, in air quotes, normally the fraud is either doesn't, no one cares about it, or it isn't discovered for a long time or years, sometimes ever. Einhorn, actually, if you want to go more in depth about how Einhorn re researches some of these frauds, I bought an audiobook. I didn't read it yet. It is called Fooling Some of the People All the Time, a long, short story. Einhorn took copies of that from his investors' newsletter, and it's about allied capital. So I have the book. I just haven't read it yet. It's, it's 13 hours long on audiobook, but that's you know, you get to th you get to read about his thoughts and his analysis of how he does research into finding shorting opportunities. The problem nowadays is that a lot of these frauds, no one really goes to prison for. Look at all the crazy stuff that happened to Mark Cajodes, and he found egregious fraud. He found egregious fraud with my medics. If you want to hear one a crazy story, listen to the QTR podcast and the couple interviews that Marco Hodes has done about that. Also, Marco Hodes talks about that at length. I think there's three parts or four parts on Real Vision television interview over the last year and a half or so, where literally he has reams entire volumes of research on the fraud at my medics, and still I don't know if the stock fully has collapsed, and I don't know if the CEO is going to end up in jail or not, the former CEO, but it's a mess. Yeah, so the, the product for Beyond Meat is not healthy at all. The ingredients list is actually for Beyond Meat. Uh, one of my buddies sent me this, a comparable, and a lot of the ingredients in Beyond Meat, their their uh, meatless burger, vegan burger, is actually very similar to the ingredients list for a ver very heavily processed hot dog. <laughs> so, so Beyond Meat, the, the way to, uh, if you go back and listen to that June video I did on June 10th, I said that if you were debating shorting that thing, and I said it was too early to short it because they were still in momentum mode and growing revenue, even though I didn't like the fundamentals of the company, I said the stock wouldn't crash yet. And I said, if you were going to short that thing, you should definitely hedge it with calls. And if you would have hedged it with calls, you would have made a lot of money and you would have either offset your shorts or you would have broken way out ahead of the trade and you could have reset a new long straddle, which is a put and call stock position. There's other more sophisticated parts of the trade, but if you would have hedged with calls, and like I said, on a number of these other educational videos about companies that have ridiculous valuations or, or um, shorting opportunities where a uh, the, the failure stories where I hear from very smart people who did a lot of research on a company and start, made a short bet is they didn't protect cover their asses. They did not hedge their shorts. Okay, so they said I am a hundred percent convinced that this short position won't play out, and then they did not hedge at all. And if they would have hedged, they probably would have protected themselves a little bit. Frauds can go on a lot longer than you think, and. These management teams are very clever. They have more resources than people like us do, even more resources than most hedge fund managers. These things, these companies, what they can do is all they have to do, and you're seeing this now with Elon Musk, he is desperate to control the narrative. He is issuing crazy press releases about all kinds of new businesses that Tesla Motors is going to get in. And this is meant to distract you like in wizard of oz like the wizard behind the curtain this is meant to distract you from the fact that their automotive business tesla is growing car production but they're losing more money the more cars they produce 
okay? <laughs> so so this is this is just ridiculous. You see Teslas everywhere. Yeah, there's a lot of them in empty lots. And Tesla's gross margins are down if you remove their if you remove their uh, environmental tax credit stuff, their gross margins are 16%, which are not good. They should have stuck with the Model S, which was a quality car. Instead, they're losing money trying to make the Model 3. There's if you test check out the Tesla Q on Twitter, which is a dollar sign T S L A Q. There are pictures and monitoring of all the uh, basically lots full of Teslas that have not sold. So they are producing record amounts of cars. They're not making money doing so. The annualized losses that Tesla has are bad. What they just lost $400 million in gap losses. They produced a record amount of cars. And here the stock price is up. The stock price didn't crash. Stock price looks like it's rallied. Since May 27th, when it was at 185, it's rallied a lot. Got down to 185, things look pretty bad. And then all of a sudden, it's rallied back up to $242.26 today. And this is what I mean. In the environment we're in, the management teams know how to manipulate, know how to bend the rules, know how to walk that gray area between legal and illegal. In Elon Musk, excuse me, in Elon Musk's case, he just gets away with it. I mean, he is seriously straight up leaking in air quotes internal emails to pro Tesla, <laughs> pro Elon Musk journal journalists in air quotes who are fanboys or fangirls. He's not supposed to be doing that. The SEC should be, you know, that's serious stuff again. Uh, all of Teslas are not great products. The Model S was good. The Model 3 has a lot of service problems. They're not going to they're going to end up not honoring their warranties. It's it's going to get really bad. So, uh one more thing I wanted to talk about there was one more. Oh yes, Tilray. So, I talked about Tilray last summer and let me pull up a Tilray chart real quick. Okay, I talked about Tilray last summer. The stock got as high. It Literally, the chart is parabolic. It went as high as $214 a share about. Let's see the date here. September 19th, 2018. So it got as high as $214 per share. And I think I talked about it when it was in the 130s, something around there. And I, and I read through the annual report for you guys. I spent over an hour, probably over two hours, going through the annual report and highlighting some of the huge red flags. And so Tilray, it was predictable, very predictable, that Tilray, that Tilray would eventually collapse. That's the marijuana company. And that is because they were growing revenues very inefficiently. The losses were actually growing faster than the revenues were. So they were growing revenues. They would put out a press release or a quarterly report, and their rev they would say revenue growth, but then their losses would be fast growing faster than their revenues were. And I t told you guys, if you go back and listen to that Tilray podcast from a year ago, that once the lockup period expired, the insiders at Tilray, because they had so much gains, the stock chart was parabolic, and they knew it was disclosed in the annual reports in the disclosures there that the business was not good it even said the lawyers made the management team disclose that the business was never profitable and might what had never been profitable in the past and might never be profitable in the future so if you're a management team and you're running a business and you don't have a lot of confidence in yourself because this business that stuff's been disclosed and you're sitting on tenfold gains or more in stock you're going to dump a lot of it and that's what's happened in tilray and that is why tilray besides not having good earnings quarterly earnings is down to forty dollars 76 cents per share now it's not at zero it's probably still overvalued maybe it goes lower but that's why it crashed from you know as high as 200 and in the mid 100s down to 43 because and this is what happens with initial public offerings so sometimes the wall street investment banks will support the stock they're contractually obligated to defend the stock for X amount of months. Sometimes it's four, three months or four months. Sometimes it's six months. But then that ends, and the Wall Street banks are no longer 
obligated to defend the stock. Those are the Wall Street banks that were involved in the IPO deal. And then the other thing is the lockup period. When can management who is sitting on tenfold gains or more in their stock and is sitting on $30 million, $40 million, some of these guys in Beyond Meat have tens of millions of dollars in profits now, okay? And they know their business has a lot of challenges. They have a lot of competition. They don't have earnings yet. They don't have free cash flow. They don't have the best margins. So if you're sitting, think of it this way. This is not financial advice. I just want you guys hypothetically to put yourselves in the shoes of the CEO of Beyond Meat or the senior management of Beyond Meat. If you have tenfold or 20-fold gains on your shares, are you going to hold all your shares? No. As soon as you are, excuse me, as soon as you are legally allowed to start dumping that stock, you best be sure that th that a lot of these guys are going to start. There will be some true believers. There will be some that will hold most of their stock or all their stock. But the majority of people are going to say, you know what? I can go buy a yacht. You know what? I can go buy a mansion. You know what? My wife needs plastic surgery. <laughs> um, there's, you know, there's all these, you know what? I can pay for all my kids' colleges, uh, college. No student loans. They're going to be thinking like that. You know what? I can I can afford now two girlfriends on the side. Stuff like that. Two side chicks instead of just one. And this is why these IPOs, these unicorn bubble stocks, eventually crash. Because the insiders, once the lockup period is over, they dump. Unless the business is actually really good. Unless you see, with the revenue growth, you see earnings growth. And you start to see good margins. And you start to see free cash flow. But a lot of these companies that are being dumped and brought IPO by the venture capitalists and the management teams, they no that's normally not the case. Those are exceptions to the rule, especially lately. No, I was just joking about side chicks. I was just joking about side chicks. But seriously, though, a lot of these corporate CEOs that's and hedge fund guys, that's what they spend a lot of money on. We're going to try to keep the show PG-13. I have some really dirty stories, but I won't tell them here. I don't want the podcast demonetized. I have some really dirty stories about side chicks in the hedge fund business, but I can't tell them here because the this is PG-13. Okay, thank you for the super chat, Corey. I appreciate it. Again, I would read David Einhorn's work. I think his analysis is brilliant. The problem with shorting these things is, number one, people don't cover their own asses. They don't hedge. They're confident. And number two, people screw up the timing. The timing on these things is very tricky because the management teams are very good. They often hire marketing and PR firms. They spend a lot of money on this. They have people internally, and they can afford to hire consultants. And so they hire... PR teams, public relations teams, to put out the most stock-pumping press releases. They're allowed to get away with this now. It's, it's just very frustrating on that end that there's so much waste, fraud, corruption, and abuse. And David Einhorn in his book and others have talked about this is that the regulators, the SEC and others should be taking care of this, but they're not challenging people like Elon Musk and others. I mean, they challenged him once and then look what happened to them. He, Elon Musk has been making fun of them. Is it true that a Beyond Meat burger tastes like cat food? No, I've heard that it tastes more like a hot dog with the seasoning. It's heavily processed. A lot of the ingredients in Beyond Meat are very similar to a hot dog. Finkel is Einhorn. Einhorn is Finkel. <laughs> is that is that from Ace Ventura Pet Detective? Or are you t talking about like the CEO of BlackRock, Larry Fink? No, no, he's Fink, not Finkel. I respect David Einhorn a lot. He's my favorite. He's my favorite investor right now. He just doesn't do interviews publicly. He's a very shy guy from what I've heard. So long-term, Tesla has a lot of problems. 
Their losses are actually increasing the more cars they produce. And this is why you're seeing more press releases trying to control the narrative. I put out a tweet recently, a couple hours ago, saying how basically it's very, Elon Musk is running things very similar to a politician, a scripted politician trying to maintain c control of frame, maintain control of narrative. And the narrative is Tesla is this software company or innovative company, not a shitty car company that produces more cars and loses more money and has shitty margins every car, every time they increase production of cars. So it's like the magician's trick where you stare at one hand while the trick is being performed in the other. And that is a, a very good summary of Tesla. Writing bubbles is the most profitable, profitable part of stocks like Beyond. Yes, and if you would have hedged, this is not financial advice, and when I talked about it back then, it wasn't either. In my opinion, if you would have hedged your Beyond shorts, and some people were telling me that they had shorted and made that 40%, who knows if they covered, but if you would have hedged your Beyond shorts back then with calls, you would have done well. Even though there's no fundamental reason to be long the stock, I don't think the stock has any good fundamentals, but in this bubble, these bubble markets that we're in, all this extra liquidity from foreign central banks, from the Federal Reserve, from flight capital from other countries, it's coming here to the U.S. and it's buying a lot of stuff that should not be bought. So I think this will continue until it doesn't. I wish the regulators would do their jobs more, but they don't seem intent on doing so. These large publicly traded companies normally don't get a lot of in, into a lot of trouble, unfortunately. You went long beyond on the open and sold last week. Congratulations. It was not a fundamental trade. You made a lot of money. Right in the bubble up. The bubble will crash. Two or three years from now, if Beyond doesn't execute, if Beyond Meat doesn't execute, there will be a lot more competition because of how much their stock price has gone up. There will be a ton more competition. All the food companies, whether it's Hormel, Tyson Foods, Nestle, all the food companies will all have competing products. And you know what? The thing about capitalism and competition is it's deflationary. It's beneficial for consumers. They have more choice, but it hurts margins. So that will hurt Beyond Meat's margins even further. And they don't have a moat. They don't have any intellectual property. Oh, I'm not covering China in this podcast. Once there's more stories on China, I'll do some updates for you guys. Kyle Bass was tweeting out some very interesting stuff the last couple days, though. Looks like the Chinese army may be crossing the border from Shenzhen into Hong Kong, the People's Liberation Army. That would be very, very bad for the people of Hong Kong. Mark Cajones? No, Mark Cajodes. He's a famous short seller on Wall Street, but he does have cojones. If you want to, oh, there's a really good interview that was just done by Christopher Irons for QTR from Tesla Charts. So that has really good analysis. That's two hours long, though. That was put out a couple days ago about Tesla Motors and the update after their earnings release. And then also uh, Mark Cajodes, he's been interviewed uh, a handful of times by QTR podcast and also on Real Vision t Television. Cajodes made a ton of money shorting on Wall Street. He was considered one of like the top five or top ten short short sellers. Very, very well respected on Wall Street. I don't know if the FBI guys were fake. The Real Vision interview was mad, mad, mad crazy. The fake FBI guys turning up at his property. I don't know if the FBI guys were fake. They might have been corrupt. The Congress, supposedly a congressman or senator out of Georgia was, was who is good friends with the MyMedic CEO, made some phone calls. Oh, 
a weed business going out in smoke. Well, I think the marijuana industry has a bright future. The problem is a lot of these marijuana companies, especially the publicly traded ones out of Canada, they had really ridiculous bubble valuations. And if you looked at their fundamentals and especially their earnings releases, their valuations were not justified. So it was a matter of time before they would crash. I think um, the market cap for Tilray went from $20 billion and it's crashed down to $3 billion. So the Tilray has had an enormous crash and it still might be overvalued because I'm not sure if they're profitable. Let me see. Yeah, they still don't have profits. They're still losing a dollar per share. <laughs> they're still losing a dollar per share. So again, this goes back to what I read in the annual report from the disclosure when, Til when Tilray IPO'd. The company in their history, and they'd been around for 10 years, had never been profitable. And it said in there that they may never be profitable, even though they're going to grow revenues. So I would have viewed that as a red flag. Now, the timing of how to make money shorting that stock would have been very tricky. But there was an opportunity there. <laughs> okay, guys. Well, we're at 30 minutes now. I think that's pretty much it. I will attach these articles if you want to read up more on this. I have two good articles three good articles on Beyond Meat and two good articles about David Einhorn talking about some of these bubble stock valuations. But I think there's going to be more bubble stocks as long as you're going to see stocks go up like Tilray for a short amount of time or stocks like Beyond Meat go up, you know, 700% since their official IPO at $25 per share. You're going to see the venture capitalists continue to dump more of these IPOs. Not all of them are going to be successful. I think one of those cooking companies where they send you a, a partially prepared meal kit like Blue Apron or one of those, one of those is down like 90, more than 90%. But as long as they're going to get a few big winners like Beyond Meat, they're going to continue to dump more of these companies onto the public markets. And it's just, is caveat mTOR, buyer beware. You do not want to, this again, this is not financial advice, just my opinion. You do not want to buy and hold these stocks. Because these companies, a lot of them are not making money. They lose a lot of money. A lot of them don't have a moat. They don't have any intellectual property. So they are very vulnerable, vulnerable to a lot of competition. And eventually, that competition will start to hurt companies like Beyond Meat. Might be a year from now, might be two years, might be three years. I don't know exactly. I would... My educated guess would be, again, not financial advice, stupid disclaimer. My educated guess about Beyond Meat is Beyond Meat will start to crash six months, about six months, or at most a year after the insiders really start to dump the stock. So they have already done a capital raise. If the stock price goes higher, there will probably be more capital raises. And then the insiders, if they're sitting on 10-fold, 20-fold, 30-fold gains in their shares, they will dump. There will be massive dumping of shares. And that will be your, your hint that the insiders think the stock is grossly overvalued. They do not want most of their net worth tied up in that stock. And it is time. And then the stock will really start to roll over and collapse. Twenty twenty is going to be the end game of the global macro stuff. Yeah, but some of these some of these individual companies might not necessarily go down. Some of these bubble companies, you don't know. The biotech companies are independent. A lot of them were independent from general macro. And I think Tesla, Tesla's, Tesla's major competition is still coming. There's a lot of competition coming from Tesla, coming towards Tesla, coming at Tesla. No, the rate cut, the rate cut, I'm not going to give a prediction for the rate cut because it really doesn't matter. I'll talk about the rate cut afterwards. The short-term stuff doesn't matter. Unless you're a day trader, the rate cuts and stuff don't matter. In my opinion, the U.S. is in a currency war now with the European Union. So it's the Federal Reserve versus European Central Bank. The days of coordinating quantitative easing and other things are over. And it's back to beggar thy neighbor policies from the 1930s, similar to that. So that means currency wars and trade wars. The rate cuts are meant to prevent the dollar from getting too strong against the euro. Meanwhile, you have the European Central Bank promising more rate cuts because the, the European Union wants the excuse me the European Union wants a weaker euro. Oh, looks like we have a lot of trolls.
Okay, guys, well, that's it for this live stream show. Go watch some baseball and go relax. Everyone have a nice rest of your evening.